So Global Marketing Insights is focused on airborne, spaceborne, and the supporting geospatial technologies that actually focus on building those capabilities globally. Welcome to GeoBiz. We have a, a very special guest today, Dr. Shivana uh, Johnson from Global Marketing Insights. Hello. Uh, welcome, uh, Shivana. Uh, can you let us know what exactly is uh, Global Marketing Insight? I, I just uh, came to know that it is about bridging gap between government and businesses. So how exactly you bridge the gap between government and businesses? So Global Marketing Insights is focused on airborne, spaceborne, and the supporting geospatial technologies that actually focus on building those capabilities mm -hmm. globally. Mm -hmm. So we produce three types of products. Mm -hmm. Highly implementable strategic plans, mm -hmm. go-to-market action plans, mm -hmm. and very highly customized market research. Mm -hmm. And that research and those plans are utilized in several ways. Mm -hmm either um, with the intelligence community and the Department of Defense mm -hmm. to bridge technology into the private sector or the federal civil community mm -hmm. or with the federal civil community and the private sector to bridge their capabilities mm -hmm. and share those capabilities into the intelligence communities and DOD. So we actually work on both sides of the investment and the development of geospatial technologies and spaceborne collections and okay. airborne collections. Okay. I also see that uh, you have uh, done work for the international, uh, you have brought out international remote sensing decadal studies for NOAA and USGS as well. Uh, had, are there any current uh, uh, work happening in, on this uh, front as well? So many of the decadal studies are just mm -hmm. getting ready to kick off again. Oh, I see. And, uh, um, I think 2017 uh -huh. will be the next series of decadal studies. Okay. It depends on what they feel the need is, mm -hmm. where we end up playing a role. Mm -hmm. It could be that we represent the private sector and bring the private sector in to participate and to explain in the decadal surveys what mm -hmm. it is they're looking for, what mm -hmm. it is they need, and what role they want uh, global governments to play. Mm -hmm. Or it could be that a government institution comes to us and says, we need to really understand how the private sector utilizes our capability, our space-based capability, mm -hmm. and they're not good at collecting that kind of data mm -hmm. because that's not who their constituency or client base is, and we might end up doing that. Considering that uh, you, it's, it's like seven, eight years now uh, uh, that you've got the earlier decadal report, is it? We have a decadal information back to 2004. Okay. And the most recent, the most recent ends yes. in 2020. Okay. So they cross over each other. Oh, so there's 2004, 2006, mm -hmm. 2008, 2010 projects out through 2020. 2020. Okay. So uh, the I mean in the last uh, uh, five to seven years there have been uh, tremendous changes in terms of uh, the small satellites, oh, the yes. UAVs, uh, a lot of uh, changes. Yes. So what is the um, uh, technological trends that you're seeing in this industry uh, dominating the scene? So I think the biggest change is um, the realization and the coming to terms with the fact that satellite imagery is uh, commoditized yes. and the, the price points are coming down. Mm -hmm. um, more and more individuals, mm -hmm. governments, mm -hmm. companies understand where and how to get the data. Mm -hmm. uh, they understand also better how to access space-based assets from space agencies, whether it be ESA mm -hmm. or NASA mm -hmm. uh, or another space agency. And that continues to drive the commercialization and the commoditization of the pricing down. Mm -hmm. And then you enter the new environment of small sats, nanosats, CubeSats, mm -hmm. and the ability that they can be built and launched mm -hmm. um, on a much more regular basis and a less expensive basis than some of our space-based assets mm -hmm. have previously mm -hmm. uh, been done. Mm -hmm. But they don't offer the same kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But I think the number one change mm -hmm. is the amount of space observations yes. that are coming 
and are already here today. Okay. Do you see with the, with the advent of small satellites and the proliferation of too many sensors, small satellites uh, uh, in the space, are they giving some kind of a competition to the conventional satellites? So competition's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. I think logically it makes sense that they would be more competition. Mm -hmm. But when I look at things from a user's perspective, yes, which is what we always do, we are data agnostic, platform agnostic, the user still wants something that solves his specific problem. Exactly. Many times, the small satellites and the CubeSats and the NanoSats and those programs are being funded mm -hmm. because the funding mechanism is available, mm -hmm. and the investment is available, mm -hmm. and somebody wants to buy that capability for a very specific use in their company, mm -hmm. i.e. Google buying Skybox, Skybox. Imaging, right? Um, that will change the face of what Skybox was going to do in the marketplace. Many of these companies are obtaining investment mm -hmm. money mm -hmm. due to the fact that the investing partner has its eye on a very specific market domain. Yes. That doesn't mean that it will necessarily compete or cause a reduction in the market space mm -hmm. for the bigger, more um, robust mm -hmm and long life satellites provided by commercial companies that have been in the space a long time or by space agencies. Mm -hmm. Okay, but there are several other satellites. Uh, Skybox is one uh, specific example. Def definitely uh, Google bought over for a specific reason, but there are several other satellite companies. So they, these, I think, uh, are pretty much uh, more open-ended uh, uh, in terms of uh, their data approach kind of a thing. So do you see some kind of a, a complementing our uh, aspect uh, these, with the availability of these data as well as we go forward, of course? I think they will complement other mm -hmm. data sets and they'll be used when whatever has been utilized for free, mm -hmm. it does not provide the type of resolution mm -hmm. and the type of coverage and the frequency of coverage that's needed. So someone that's used Landsat for set, let's say, Landsat 8 for a long period of time to do their land management and to get a regional or global look at crop use in their country, mm -hmm. they'll probably still use that. Mm -hmm. But when the question comes down to drought and what the impact is on the, cr the crop, they'll continue probably to use the NASA and ESA data that mm -hmm. they use. Mm -hmm. But when they want to get down to specific yield uh, production questions and be able to say this is the crop that's going to be impacted, this is the size and the acreage or the hectares that are impacted, that opportunity then takes them right to a more frequent, different resolution and something that is more readily available due to cloud cover and the variety of issues in agricultural framework. So I think they're going to rapidly and often complement each other. Okay. You talked about the commoditization of Earth observation imagery. Do you see that opening up new avenue, new business avenues? If so, what are they? So for with the commoditization of mm -hmm. data, mm -hmm. What really is opening up are the predictive analytics mm -hmm. in terms of algorithms mm -hmm. and live analytics that provide you a future glimpse into mm -hmm. what is going to happen. Mm -hmm. The more data they have to work on at a lower price, mm -hmm. the better the analytics, the underpinning analytics and algorithms seem to progress and the faster they progress mm -hmm. in terms of managing that data, accessing the data mm -hmm. and making predictions about pattern of life or uh, some impact to a specific user group based on the fact that now they have more data at their disposal. Mm -hmm. Okay, going forward, say five to ten years, five years to seven years, uh, where do you see this uh, industry, the space-based uh, remote sensing in industry heading towards? I think in five to ten years, mm -hmm. we will have a better public-private partnership globally mm -hmm. between a variety of governments, whether it's ISRO and India with other commercial companies that build and launch satellites, whether it's ESA mm -hmm. with the plethora of European companies that are launching and building satellites 
unmanned aerial vehicles, new imagers, and I think the same is true here for NASA. Mm -hmm. And they're all looking for ways to take advantage of the global capabilities mm -hmm. that our nations mm -hmm. have developed over time and the billions of dollars that have been invested over time into those space-based and airborne-based assets. And yet at the same time, create ways in which with smaller, faster technology, they can develop capabilities that are more user-oriented and not lose sight of the fact that many of these capabilities wouldn't have been possible if we hadn't had those investments. So I think in five to 10 years, I see a narrowing of the gap mm -hmm. between how our governments, mm -hmm. whether that's intelligence community oriented, Department of Defense oriented, Defense Ministry oriented, and space oriented, I see them reaching out joining forces with the federal civil part of the governments, local law enforcement, emergency responders, and all of those private sector science and research companies who are building faster, more easily manipul manipulated birds and sensors and imagers as well as provide on-the-fly capability in terms of solutions. Okay, so the user is the winner in the entire partnership model. Uh, the user thing. is the winner yeah. because the data becomes more accessible, mm. it becomes easier to use, and it becomes very driven towards that particular user's domain and problem True. need. True. And the disruptive uh, technology that is uh, taking this industry by storm is the, definitely the unmanned aerial vehicles. So it, I think it remains to be seen yes. if it's going to take the industry by storm, mm -hmm. but let's just say it's causing quite, well, quite a, a storm. <laughs> Already. So yes, yeah. so everyone is looking at a variety of the vehicles, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of size manned versus unmanned mm -hmm. or both. Mm -hmm. How big of a payload mm -hmm. can it carry? Mm -hmm. uh, what is the range? Mm -hmm. And what's the downlink and storage capacity? Mm -hmm. And what is the battery life? Okay. So there are many other industries being spawned mm -hmm. by the focus on drone and unmanned True. aerial assets. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, the cellular platform is kind of the un un underpinning platform to the drone industry and the data sets that are going to come down from that because they've got to get them onto a machine to machine or an internet of things platform so that it's usable and readily distribution oriented. Okay, um, moving to uh, much closer to the, uh, the terrestrial uh, remote sensing, mm -hmm. what, are this, uh, what are the trends you see and that are making uh, the capture of data and uh, much, much simpler and affordable for the users? So I think one of the most popular trends that we see in terms of market research mm -hmm. is the m more use of ground penetrating radar. Okay. So ground penetrating radar um, now is much more common. Mm -hmm. So you see everything from the, the Earth observation satellites of a city to then a 3D building infrastructure True. model, a building information model. And then we can go beneath ground and look at all the infrastructure below ground. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of advancements being made in ground penetrating radar mm -hmm. and how that data are uploaded and then managed in these 3D and BIM models. So I think first and foremost, that's probably the most exciting thing on the terrestrial and subterrestrial level. Mm -hmm. And it's common knowledge now. So it's not something that you could would mention at, at a, a cocktail party and nobody would know what you're talking about. A lot of, um, it's becoming more of a household name. So I think that's exciting, but I also think the terrestrial imagers and companies that provide that mm -hmm. are always on the leading edge mm -hmm. of capability. Mm -hmm. Companies like Trimble and other providers of these capabilities are always 
five to 10 years out in their own research and development to make their tools and their products more user friendly and more survivable in a variety of climates and interchangeable with other data sets. So it's no longer uh, I provide this capability and the user has to figure out what to do if they want to go from a very local to a regional to a global level. They're helping their own data and their own products be interoperable in those environments. That, to me, from a, at the terrestrial level, is it very exciting. And truthfully, it's the terrestrial companies mm -hmm. that have one of the largest user bases in the world. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times, mm -hmm. from space to air yeah. and so remote sensing to the terrestrial level, the number one largest user base mm -hmm. is the terrestrial mm -hmm. folks, the engineers, the surveyors. The surveyors, yes. Mm -hmm. And they're the real users, and they are the ones who proliferate mm -hmm. the capabilities and the use of the data. True, true. Thank you so much, Shavana. Thanks for speaking with you. It was a pleasure, and thank you. Mm -hmm.